I'm a park ranger in Yosemite Park, but I'm purposefully omitting my and the park's names. All of the participants' names have also been changed. I had to share this story, but couldn't rely on the usual channels. Because of this, I'm posting it here. I might lose my job or even worse, but I must tell the story. I owe Sophia for it. Like any other day, I showed up at the ranger station. I was assigned my own area of the park to watch over. Unfortunately, because of the park's size, my section typically only covers half of it. Therefore, taking leisurely walks on the trails is not very likely. I got into the 10-year-old 4x4 I used for work and drove off to see if anyone needed help. Finding someone didn't take long. A man was having trouble starting his camper at the first campground. He began moving with a quick jump. A couple in need of directions came next. Then a canoe that had flipped over. Only a few miles had been traveled through the park by me. I would have to move if I wanted to complete a full route today. When the call came over the radio, I could eat a quick lunch and log some miles without anyone needing assistance. I had to go see what the hiker who discovered it had found. I spoke with a middle-aged woman who had discovered something concerning a half hour later. On the trail, she discovered a hat and a letter. I examined the memo. I'm unsure what's happening, so I'm writing this note and leaving it behind. Even before we graduated, the five of us friends had been planning this trip for a long time. Still, it always seemed that something came up at the last minute and prevented one or more of us from going. I almost believed for a while that something outside us was trying to harm us. We'd be forbidden from camping until we were too old to enjoy it. Now, I could visualize Devin. He would still go if he had to use a walker on the trail due to his advanced age. He is always game for going camping. I believe the man travels around with a packed backpack in his car. LOL. Following closely behind us when she arrived was Adrian, then William. Naturally, Andrew was the last to arrive. We had a great attitude as we ascended the trail. Three miles in the sun were only now becoming warm. Devin made the decision to take a detour as we were moving forward in the direction of the primitive campground. He claimed he wanted to check out an abandoned trail he had heard about. I argued that we should keep moving forward in the same direction, but I lost. Since Andrew was obviously under the influence of drugs, and Devin coerced him into voting. Yes, I believe his vote shouldn't have been counted. We reached a location off the trail where there was a sizable stone. Despite Devin saying it was the trailhead, I couldn't find any trails. On the other side, it cleared up, and we could make up the faint outline of an overgrown trail after he led us through some dense brush. In case we got lost and needed help, I went last and left my hat on the stone. I believe that's exactly where we're going, straight into the wilderness. I'll tuck this note under my hat in the hopes that someone will come across us. After I asked her to, the woman showed me where she had found it. I was gazing at the rock I hoped I would never see again three miles later. I radioed the station to let them know where I was and instructed them to send a search party to the previously abandoned trail if they hadn't heard from me in a couple of hours. I regretted not having my supplies with me. My sidearm and backpack were with me, but they were three miles away, and I had no idea how long these kids had been hiking this trail for. I knew every moment lost could be a matter of life or death. I did. However, have a knife, flashlight, and binoculars. So, after saying thank you to the woman, 
I returned the red hat to the stone just in case and stepped into the dense undergrowth. The trail was visible once I cut through the initial undergrowth. My mind was filled with old memories. Ones I desired to never revisit. I inhaled deeply before beginning to walk down the trail. It was overgrown for the first mile or so. After that, a field appeared. By the way, the weeds were partially trodden. I could tell someone had gone through before me. A deer jumped in front of me as I walked, startling me. Up until that point, I was unaware of how jittery I was. I tried to calm myself by convincing myself that these kids were lost and that I could find them and rescue them. Even though I told myself that, the memories persisted. I walked into a clearing with a fallen log and another note with a rock on it. I believe I am being foolish. It's not that bad on this trail. Maybe I was off base. Devon appears to be on a clear path. I just can't get rid of the impression that someone is watching us. Occasionally, when I turn to look, I swear I can make out a face slipping behind a tree. Am I overthinking this? If the birds started singing again, it would make me feel better. But it's been a while since I heard of a bird or other animal. Why are they so quiet, I wonder? Do they worry about us? And speaking of brooding, Andrew seems to be doing so more often than usual. He might not have packed enough supplies for the journey. Since everyone depends on Devon for directions, he is in his element. William and Adrienne appear to be traveling with us. However, I have also seen William glancing around at the trees. I might ask him if he notices anything. I hope we aren't causing too much trouble if you try to find us. I simply have this impression. I prayed she was mistaken about being followed as I folded the note and put it in my pocket. I continued, longing for my supply-filled backpack, especially the water bottles. Although the sun wasn't directly on me because of the trees, hiking is always a thirst-inducing activity. I nearly forgot about the frantic mission I was on to save these five children as I was distracted by the birds chirping in the trees. My thoughts returned to the child. I was powerless to help. It happened soon after I had begun working as a park ranger. On this very trail, an 11-year-old boy got lost. Before asking us to look for him, his parents made a valiant effort to locate him. As we organized search parties and combed every inch of the trail, I recall hoping to be the one to find him. I eventually got what I wanted. I'm glad I didn't find him, though. I ignored the memory and kept my attention on the trail. It was getting lighter. I was becoming disoriented due to the trampling of feet that weren't significantly impacted me. That may be fatal here. I persisted in going forward and finally found the trail again just in time to get to the fork. I alternated between each option but failed to discern any distinction between them. Despite my search, there were no broken twigs or plants that might have provided me with a hint. I saw a small piece of paper in the weeds just as I was about to give up and flip a coin. I located it and read it. We appear to be in a pickle. A sort of fork in the road. You'd think I'd be relieved to see the uncertainty in Devon's eyes as he considered his options, but you'd be wrong. My confidence suffered as a result. I began to feel as though we would never leave this place. Devon yelled at us for not conserving water, but I saw him finish the last of his as well. Everyone is running out of water. He yelled and swore at us for a while but we all knew he was just frustrated because he had no idea what to do. Finally, he conducted a coin flip. All of us tried our hardest not to laugh. 
With Devin's attitude, Adrian has had it with him and is at her wit's end. William has been acting as a mediator to prevent them from fighting too much. It was way too quiet for Andrew. He has never once lit up in my presence. He has a problem, but he keeps telling me nothing is wrong. The fact that the birds are still silent is starting to really annoy me. I'm still experiencing this strange sensation. I question William about unusual sights, but he won't discuss them. This trail has been our route for some time. I'm hoping to reach a conclusion soon. By the way, we took the left trail in case the note was blown or moved. By the time I finished reading that note, I was in a panic, so it was a huge relief when she said which trail to take. I radioed in to say I was searching for the missing hikers. I spoke of choosing the left side at the fork. I was informed that a search party had not yet been dispatched. I was the only person searching for these children. It was entirely different from searching for that child earlier in time. Everybody was looking. I'm certain we explored every square inch of that wilderness. But the woods have that drawback. Even after thorough searching, something might still remain a secret. I was still unaware of how close I was to catching up to these kids as the sun set. They might be hours ahead of me, or I might run into them in the next clearing. In the afternoon, I met with the woman who had shown me the hat and note. They might be five or six hours ahead of me if they left around dawn. It's difficult to say how far the leader may have come if they are determined to keep going. I persisted in following the trail until I reached a downed tree that was spanning a river. I looked along the water's edge both ways but couldn't see a trail, so I crossed the tree. The argument the kids had when they arrived was in my mind. I chuckled at the idea that Devin must persuade them to cross. One crossing allowed me to gain a significant amount of time. I dove into the water and drank to my heart's content before climbing back up, feeling much better. Picking up the trail on the other side was challenging. I was happy to discover a note attached to a branch. Oh my goodness, when we reached that tree over the river, Devin nearly lost it. He immediately hopped up on it and began to cross. The rest of us weren't sure the trail went in that direction. He was questioned about how a trail could be designed that included a downed tree. He sputtered, stomped, and said that we would be lost without him. William told him we were lost because of him because he had finally had it. Devin was about to swing at him when Andrew, of all people, stood by him and told Devin to stop talking. The rest of us gathered and told Devin that as long as he stopped acting like a petty tyrant, he could continue to lead us. It didn't sit well with him. He concluded by telling us that we could all go to hell. He remained stationary as he sat on the log. William eventually said we should get going and led us across the tree after we took a break and refilled our water bottles in the river. Devin trailed behind, acting like a frightened puppy. William and I talked about the face that vanished and that neither of us had seen since. The birds are at least singing again. Devin would probably cry like a baby over the whole thing, so I laughed. However, the chuckle was followed by worry. Usually, overthrown leaders are dangerous. I questioned Devin's offense level and whether he intended to exact any small or significant retaliation. The forest was quickly turning dark. I had to choose something. Either stay put for the night or move on. I could protect myself from the predators that hid in the shadows if I camped. However, there was a good chance that if I kept walking, I would run into the group before dawn. It wasn't really a decision at all. 
These kids, who I didn't even know, and the fact that I had dove into the woods without even my supply backpack. I was going to try to catch up with them, of course. Would that child still be alive if I had done that years ago? Such things bothered me. I could keep them at bay on most days, but in this particular forest, not far from where I discovered him, I had to concentrate. I must move forward if I intend to pursue them further. When I stepped off the trail to relieve myself, I heard a metallic snap and experienced severe leg pain. I realized I had stepped into a bear trap when I looked down. I screamed, threw myself to the ground, and rocked violently in pain. After a while, I concentrated on removing the trap from my leg. I screamed as I used a branch to pry open the trap. I could remove the trap from my leg and cast it aside. Although I didn't want to, I had to remove my boot to inspect the damage. I had to use all my strength to unlace the boot and remove it. I had a purple leg. I gently probed the wound, but there didn't seem to be a break. That didn't mean I wouldn't be hobbling around for the following month. But it did imply that I would continue to purchase this particular brand of boots. Putting the boot back on took a lot more work and some screaming, but I knew I had to keep going. After tying the boot, I looked for a sturdy branch that I could use as a crutch. I climbed to my feet with difficulty and took a few hesitant steps. It became simpler once I settled into a rhythm, but I could no longer move as quickly as before. Of course, it was when I heard footsteps in the nearby trees that I was at my weakest. I knew it was nearby because the predator could tell I was in a vulnerable position. I prepared my crutch as a weapon as I leaned against a tree. The steps drew nearer. They paused as if sensing my readiness and then slowly resumed following me. They moved slowly but deliberately. Every movement seemed deliberate as if, waiting for the ideal opportunity to strike. Near the tree I was hiding behind, I heard it. I turned as quickly as possible and raised my crutch to make contact. A deer gave me a brief moment of attention before turning and running through the woods. I lost consciousness while leaning against the tree and fell to the ground, allowing the adrenaline to leave my body. I don't recall dozing off. Sandpaper scraping against the side of my face woke me up. When I opened my eyes, a bear was cuddling and licking my cheek. I screamed in terror rolled away from it, and freaked out. That response wasn't anticipated by the bear. It fled after becoming alarmed. I looked around while slowing my rapid breathing. In the darkness, there was a little light coming through the trees from tiny moonlight shafts. When I looked at my watch, it was almost four in the morning. I pulled the tiny flashlight out of my pocket and hoped it would still work as I slowly and carefully stood up on my injured ankle. I knew my prayers had been heard when the beam shone brightly through the woods. I panned around to locate myself. I eventually located the trail and began stumbling in its direction. The nocturnal sounds were soothing. If the forest was singing its nightly tune and the crickets were chirping, at least it meant no predators nearby. I lost my footing and fell, slamming my sprained ankle into a rock. I screamed as the pain overcame me. I stood up after taking a few minutes to recover and continued slowly while concentrating more on the ground. I berated myself for drowsing and wasting all that time. The trail was at least simple to follow. I kept going all night, hoping I wouldn't be too late. I began to consider the boy I'd failed to save and what would happen if I didn't succeed in saving these kids. The rangers division would probably say that I tried my best. 
They weren't the ones who worried me. It was me. Would I be able to accept responsibility for allowing something to occur again? I was distracted from my thoughts as I entered a clearing. Not any clearing, though. There was still visible fire damage. Tent pegs being pulled out of the ground left imprints on the surface. There were indications of a recent campsite everywhere, including a pitched tent. I became so ecstatic while searching for any signs of anything that I almost knocked my crutch over. The tent was not entirely beneficial. It was very concerning that it was still present while everyone else had left. Still, I was able to gather some supplies to bring with me as I continued my search. Food was the most crucial factor. I ate some beef jerky and shoved some protein bars in my pocket. I also took two water bottles out of the pack. I stumbled upon a note beneath a rock next to the blazing fire. I extended my hand to the fire before I sat. Even though it was still warm, the embers were almost out. It had been lit for several hours. I would have caught up to them without taking my unintentional nap. I had to read the note while sitting by the dying fire. I hoped the news was good. We chose to set up camp after finding this clearing. Walking had worn everyone out, and the atmosphere was gloomy because nobody seemed to know where we were. While we had all gone on hikes through this forest before, we had never encountered or heard of this trail. We pitched our tents, built a fire, ate dinner, and relaxed. I tried to start a conversation by asking Andrew why he was late because no one seemed interested in speaking. He dreaded telling us that he had hit an animal with his car on the way here, but eventually, at my urging, he did. When I asked if it was a deer, he replied that it was far too large to be a deer. According to him, it was massive, about eight feet tall, and covered in brown hair as it stood upright on two legs. The strangest thing was that even though he swerved to miss it, it seemed to try to jump in front of him anyway as if it wanted him to stop. We were all listening intently. At that precise moment, we heard a scream in the distance. We all went cold. Devin began ranting and cursing at Andrew for attempting to frighten us before storming off. When William attempted to stop him, the man pushed him aside and vanished into the woods. The rest of us debated whether or not to go look for him but ultimately decided it would be best to let him go and calm down. We heard a muffled cry and some rustling in the distance a moment later. We got a little closer together and raised our guard. Our eyes darted back and forth, scanning the solid wall of trees surrounding us for any indication of a predator. The strangest thing happened right then. The nightly sounds ceased entirely. Every sound you typically hear in a forest at night, crickets, squirrels, owls, etc., simply stopped. It made me uneasy. I briefly considered whether I had lost my hearing. In the shadows, our eyes darted all around. We all gathered together near the fire. William took his hunting knife out. We were all silent. It appeared that if we spoke, something negative would occur. If we spoke, whatever stopped, the noises would somehow find us. However, it wasn't the person we were expecting to speak to. What brings you here? A deep, raspy voice that seemed to resound everywhere then came. After many minutes of searching, a man finally entered the light. He was older, possibly in his fifties or sixties, and large, standing well over six feet tall with broad shoulders. In addition, he was donning a park ranger uniform. He appeared to have worn it for a very long time because it was worn out and outdated. 
No name tags or part patches were present. We weren't concerned at that point. We had received aid. We crowded around him, expressing our gratitude that he had discovered us. We told him about our experience hiking the trail and our confusion over our location. You shouldn't be here, the man slowly said after listening. We all exchanged glances. The others probably shared my sentiment, saying, No shit, we shouldn't be here, we just told you that. He kept turning to look at each of us as though assessing us. He kept quiet, and I was feeling a little uneasy. I expected him to offer to lead us, but he didn't. He continued to gaze. When William inquired whether he could direct us in the right direction, I believe everyone else was also beginning to feel a little uneasy. He appeared to be weighing his response to William as he looked at him. He said, I'll show you the way. However, you should first get some rest. We all agreed that it had been a long and demanding day. He advised us to turn it in, so we did. He declined our offer of food and water, saying he wasn't hungry. Each of us went to his or her tent and lay down. I popped out of my tent to see how our guide was doing before settling in and finishing this note. While seated by the fire, he was gazing into the orange coals. I thought I heard him murmuring or perhaps softly humming. I quietly closed the zipper on my tent and fell asleep. Later, there was a knock on my tent. When I opened it when I woke up, the ranger had an odd expression. We have to leave. Why? I said, rubbing the sleep out of my eyes. With a hint of panic, he declared, it's not safe here. I quickly returned to my tent to get dressed. Then went outside and met everyone. They were all semi-conscious at the same time. Except for the ranger, everyone appeared perplexed. He said more forcefully, Pack up, we need to go. I was about to object when I overheard a piercing scream in the distance. He looked in the direction of the sound as his head shot up. Move it, he exclaimed. Stuff up. We didn't require further explanation. We were all completely awakened by the scream. We dismantled our tents and stuffed everything into our backpacks in record time. I discovered Devin's tent was still up as I was wrapping things up. Where is Devin? I inquired. The ranger asked, Who is Devin? He's one of our friends too, I said. The moment you arrived, he disappeared into the woods by himself. The ranger reported, he didn't return. Should we go find him? I asked. The ranger made a slow circle while extending his arms. Which direction would you go? He asked. I recognized his concern about how we would know where he had gone and whether he was still on the path. Simply put, it felt like we ought to take action. What about his equipment? I asked. Should we bring it along? The ranger gave me a frustrated look as he attempted to answer my questions. He said, leave it here in case he comes back. He will require his supplies. Now that we have the ranger to lead us, I'm unsure if I'll continue leaving notes. Please find Devin and make sure he's okay, whoever finds this. The ranger? In this park, every ranger is between 30 and 40. Perhaps it was a retired person who was just hanging out there. But why would he be dressed as a... Ranger? It was alluring to nap by the smoldering embers of the fire with a tent in front of me. I could nap before the arduous hike out of here if they were in the care of a capable ranger. But I knew I had already gone to bed for the night. If it weren't for that, 
I would have arrived here hours ago, probably before the other ranger. I restarted my journey, drained but determined. I was more optimistic at the campsite than I had been all day. They were grouped together and were at least acting like campers. If only I was aware of this ranger's identity. I pulled up my flashlight to follow the trail since the sun wouldn't rise for another hour. Before I left, I zipped up the tent in case its owner did return. Animals entering and stealing everything would be undesirable. Even worse is when hurt park rangers engage in it. For a while, the trail remained level as dawn broke through the trees. The fact that the trail began to ascend was bad news for my injured ankle. It made things more difficult, but my reliable crutch supported me. Dawn helped me a little by creeping into the forest. I wouldn't have to spend time holding a flashlight, at least. The trail became narrower as the ascent grew steeper. Sometimes, it was no wider than a foot. As I climbed the extremely narrow trail, I grabbed onto any available trees and other objects. At the most challenging, I paused and pondered, going back. I spotted colorful fabric at the bottom of the ravine as I searched the area for another way to proceed. I carefully walked while looking through my binoculars. It was a backpack with a young woman's body attached to it. She appeared to have suffered a head injury on the bottom rocks. Blood and bruises covered her face. Her clothing had blood stains and was torn. There was no doubt that she had been bitten by a creature. The only remaining doubt was whether she was still alive when it began to eat her. I turned my head away. Still, I was even more determined to find these missing children. Even though they were with the ranger, they were still in grave danger. I made my way slowly up the rocky trail. I had moments where I thought I would lose my footing and end up like the poor unfortunate girl at the bottom of the ravine. That's when I recalled my radio. I attempted to call in and report the body's location, but all I received was static. When I reached the trail summit, I decided to try again. It served as yet another incentive to keep moving, to take precautions, and to survive. I felt like I was climbing that ravine side for hours at a snail's pace. I eventually fought my way up to the top and over the edge. I flipped over onto a flat surface and lay there for a while. I gasped for air and then slowly and painfully stood up. I had not been kind to my ankle. I limped in the direction of the trail and started to follow. It didn't take me long to find the remains of another campsite. Compared to the previous fire, this one was a bit warmer. To get it going, I stoked it up and added more wood. I was aware that I had to rest. After looking around, I discovered a note I had read while sitting on a log next to the fire. Adrian's departure surprises me. The trail grew narrower as we ascended this narrow ravine. I asked the ranger if there was another way around it, but he glared and replied that there wasn't. We all had trouble carrying our hefty packs. I had to get down on all fours at one point to prevent myself from falling into the ravine. That is when it took place. Adrian struggled to keep her feet on the path. She continued to fall. Several times, I reached out to assist her with her balance. Since she was directly in front of me, I tried to observe her whenever possible. That wasn't nearly enough for me because I was keeping an eye on my feet. She slipped once, and when I reached out to grab her, she had already fallen over the side due to the weight of her backpack. She fell into the ravine, hitting trees as she went and I watched in horror. 
I witnessed several times that she slid to a stop at the bottom that her skull made a solid impact. As I called her name, I could not see if she was still breathing. She remained still. I pointed to her motionless body and called for the ranger before us. He gave her a long, intense look. I'm unsure if he was looking to see if she was still alive. He instructed us to continue climbing the trail until we reached the top, and he would check on her. I observed him carefully descending the nearly sheer slope. We continued to move forward as directed. When we arrived at the top, he was still halfway down. I had lost it. We made it, and I was so relieved, but Adrienne was hurt. I didn't hold up much hope that the ranger would ride into camp with her on his back and claim that she was only slightly injured. We built a fire and then collapsed in front of it. When Andrew finally approached, he spoke with me. He said, Look, I know she was your friend and ours. For them, we have to get out of here together. I managed to half smile and said, That's so stupid it makes sense. The ranger then made a second appearance. He remained silent while sitting by the fire. His eyes had something in them. It wasn't sadness, but I'm not sure what it was exactly. She wasn't returning, and we knew that. We took a short break before resuming our trail walk. I hope you're being cautious if you're following us. Be careful. Wow. This girl is extraordinary. She still wants me to be safe despite everything she has been through. Hope I can locate her. She seems like a good ranger to me. My guilty mind shouted at me from behind my back. When that poor girl just lost her friend and needs your help, how can you sit around and relax? It was right. I knew that. I simply didn't understand why that other ranger was acting so irresponsibly. I fought to stand up, extinguished the fire, and then went after them. Even though it was only 8 in the morning, the light faded. I noticed the cause when I looked up. The sky was being overtaken by storm clouds. Another justification for why I should have brought my backpack. Raindrops struck like a slap in the face from the cold. Although it was still September, the weather out here in the mountains could change in an instant. The weather changed enough for me to shiver even though we weren't at the mountain's peak. I tried my radio again once we were out of the ravine, but all I got was static. I knew there were some locations where the radio would mysteriously stop working. I only wanted to leave the interference behind before it was too late. Although I was walking through open fields without any protection from the rain, the trail was clear in front of me. I walked through all those trees, and now that it's raining, I have wide open spaces. Someone doesn't like me, I'd say. The downpour lasted longer than a simple spring shower. I had trouble seeing in front of me because it was pouring so heavily. I trudged through the rain for a while. I had the impression of moving in place at times. My boots were beginning to cake with mud. Then my deliverance materialized. A tent was located on the trail in front of me. I yelled before opening the tent's zipper and letting myself inside. I collapsed to the wonderful, dry floor before quickly turning and closing the door again. I exhaled a sigh of relief, but as I did, my nose was attacked by a foul smell. I turned to look at the bag. It was completely full. I apologized for rudely entering but had to leave in the rain. Zero reaction. I poked the individual in the bag. It leaned to one side before immediately rocking back. I then became aware of the red blotches that had permeated the bag. 
I pulled the sleeping bag's top away from the person's face even though I didn't want to see it. The unfortunate part was that they were faceless. The neck had been gouged out, and it had been torn apart. The body also had several significant wounds. My fingers went straight into the neck muscles when I tried to feel for a pulse, so I assumed there wasn't one there. I wondered why this person was covered as I wiped my fingers on the sleeping bag. I'm certain the animal that did this did not gently wrap a sleeping bag around the victim once it was finished. I discovered that my solution was sitting on top of the person's head. It was on paper. I'm in disbelief that Andrew is dead. I wish I had skipped this trip. I regret allowing Devin to intimidate us into abandoning this trail. Devin is nowhere to be found, anyway. Did he come across whatever the creature was that had been stalking us when he stormed off on his little pity party? Is he currently relaxing in his tent and taking it easy? Really, I have no idea. Although we enjoyed not having to ascend a ravine's face, we were exhausted. I told the ranger about stopping and briefly camping. He took a look at everything and even took a whiff. That appeared to be a strange thing to do. But following that, he consented to let us pitch our tents. He even instructed us to finish it as soon as possible. He warned us not to bother because it would rain as we gathered wood for a fire. That would seem to explain the air sniffing phenomenon. When it began to rain, our tents had only been set up for about 15 minutes. Rapidly, it became a downpour. Each of us invited the ranger to join us in our tents. He examined each of us individually. It was somewhat eerie. He finally announced that he would join Andrew in his tent. William and I exchanged relieved looks with one another. The ranger is assisting us, but I don't want to ever see him again. He simply displays odd behavior. I sometimes question whether he is actually aiding. When the ranger tore open my tent, I had just closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep while listening to the rain on the tent. He instructed us to get ready and leave immediately. Somebody or something was after us. We hurriedly packed our tents before diving out into the pouring rain. He assured us a cave was nearby and we could take refuge there. I was getting ready when I noticed Andrew wasn't there, so I went over to his tent and knocked. I entered and discovered what was left of his body when there was no response. He had been torn to pieces by something. I ran outside to tell the others while covering my mouth to prevent myself from throwing up. When William and the ranger peered inside, they realized they could not assist him. The ranger claimed that after leaving the tent to use the restroom, he returned to find a predator hanging around the tent. He arrived at that time and woke us up. Andrew must already be aware of it. I covered him with his sleeping bag and wished we had more time for a decent funeral. However, the ranger warned that the creature might return for the rest of us. So we hastily packed up and departed. I hardly had enough time to complete this note. Please assist us. A cave? He is what kind of ranger? Does he not understand that would be the most likely location for a large predator to reside? I briefly considered which cave he might be referring to. This trail hadn't been used by me in five years. Since I discovered the child here. Then it dawned on me. We were not far from where we discovered him. If not, why would he take them there? I leaped up so quickly that I accidentally overbalanced my injured ankle when I forgot and almost fell on my body. I limped out of the tent and went as quickly as possible toward where I vowed never to return. As I got closer to the cave, 
My heart sank. Just inside the door, two backpacks were parked. My knife and flashlight were ready, so I cautiously peered inside. I turned when I sensed a change in the breeze and saw the ranger looking at me. I gave him a thorough look. You, I uttered. We found the boy, that was the last time I saw you. He remained silent. I asserted, there was never a chance of animal attack. You were it, he moved closer to me. He replied, of course it was. It was wonderful watching you floundering around, looking for some predator standing beside you years ago. You are a son of a bitch. I took my knife out and held it ready. After pausing, he grinned. Are you sure that knife won't hurt me? I examined it. I replied, pretty sure. It is constructed of iron. His grin disappeared. So you are aware of who I am. I took a bottle of brown water out of my bag. I mentioned that I had taken care to collect some rainstorm runoff. Even though it might not work like rust water, let's find out. I popped open the bottle and showered him with water. He avoided it as if it were acid. I swung the knife at the same time. He dodged effortlessly. Why don't you turn into the big pussy that you are? I said, taunting him. He explained that we both understand that when I transform, I become temporarily vulnerable. And I'm sure you would love to exploit a weak spot, she continued. He struck my stomach with his swing, taking the wind out of me. I stood up and swung the knife at him with a vicious downswing, but he easily avoided it. I continued to advance, slashing and stabbing at him. I was unable to get close enough to communicate. Too fast was he. You won't be able to beat me, he said. I said you look like a wounded deer just waiting to be eaten. Yinald Lucia, be quiet. I screamed. He froze when his name was mentioned. I was aware of my limited time. I seized the opportunity and swung my knife at him. If I hadn't been hurt, I would have taken two quick steps to close the gap between us and plunge the knife into his heart. Unfortunately, I neglected to think about my sprained ankle in the moment's excitement. I moved forward on my healthy leg, but I stumbled as soon as I tried to put weight on the hurt one. The knife sliced through his left thigh rather than his heart. In agony, he screamed and fled the cave. I pulled up my flashlight and went to the cave's back. I discovered a dismembered body there, next to a heap of bones. In her hand, she held a note. I took it and sat down to read. I can't believe how foolish I was to fail to notice this earlier. Our constant direction was only a ruse. He never intended to assist us. He never gave a damn about any of us or about being safe. I have to finish this quickly before he returns. The ranger led us here and advised us to wait because the cave would keep us safe. He walked out on us. William retrieved his flashlight and continued exploring the cave. He discovered a sizable heap of bones. There was a stack of clothing off to the side of them. We sprinted for the opening, but the ranger had already come back. He said mockingly, so you didn't listen to us. I told you to stay put and not to wander around my house. What are you? I questioned. For the first time since I first met him, he grinned. But rather than being reassuring, his smile was terrifying. He transformed into a huge cat creature, and I watched in horror. It didn't quite resemble a mountain lion or a panther. He pounced on us with incredible speed. He grabbed my leg, 
causing a significant gash. I screamed as I fell to the ground. William attempted to protect me by slashing at it with his knife while holding it at bay. Still, it circled around him and surrounded him. He only had one opportunity. He gave me a sad-eyed glance before sprinting past the creature and out of the cave. It gave me and my leg a quick glance before sprinting off after William. I understand his motive. He was trying to buy me time to run away, but I could not do to my leg. He actually gave me some space to say my final goodbyes. I'm so sorry if you're reading this. I apologize for causing you to perish. Tell our families what transpired here if you manage to escape and survive. Goodbye. I had to hold back tears as I read this courageous girl's last words. I hobbled to the cave entrance as the rain subsided and peered outside. It was as though a brand new world was being born. I turned on my radio and received a prompt response. They received my GPS coordinates and I warned them to expect casualties. Despite being months later, I'm still a park ranger. I made certain to block off the trail. I always have rust water and an iron knife with me. Just in case, I keep the rust water in a squirt gun. DNA testing was done on the bones taken out of the cave. Other people had vanished in the park over the years aside from this group of victims, which included Devin. According to the official account of the incident, a rogue animal had been hunting people. I was advised that keeping the predator's true identity a secret would be best for my professional future. I continued to look for the creature and place notices throughout the area asking people to watch for an older ranger sporting a uniform without any patches. If anyone sees him, please call the number provided. My personal mobile number is on there. I occasionally hear reports of a large cat hobbling on its back leg. I try to get there as fast as possible, but I haven't yet caught him. I published this tale in remembrance of that courageous girl and as a caution. Never venture onto an unmarked trail. It was close to three in the afternoon when the knock came on the door to the ranger station. Given that it was early January in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and the temperature was a balmy 12 degrees, with wind chills frequently pushing it into the negatives, I was only mildly surprised to hear it. Before dawn that morning, the wind had been howling against the remote station, and I pondered whether I would have to deal with any damage to my small home after the storm passed. I had been watching the weather radar and forecast all day. By the time evening arrived, it had appeared that I would be experiencing a significant blizzard. Even though it had been snowing most of the day, it hadn't been particularly heavy. However, I anticipated that would change by nightfall, which in January was only a few hours away. Since it wasn't unusual for hikers and campers to stop on their way up the trail to the observation-areas, either to log their camping site for the night or just in hopes of a nice hot cup of coffee before they continued on their hike, I didn't keep the ranger station's front door locked very often. I'd kept the door locked until I could fix it because it hadn't been latching properly lately and had the propensity to swing open when a strong gust caught it just right. The knocking was light, hesitant, and almost polite, if that makes sense. I nearly missed hearing it over the whistling of the wind and creaking of the station because it was so quiet. I had to stop typing and pay close attention to make sure I had heard it in the first place. After all, I was writing an email asking for a new generator because my current one had been acting up lately. I got up from my desk when it echoed back, this time a little louder, and drank from my steaming mug once more before going over and opening the door. Five people, 
three men and two women were standing outside. They were all wearing what appeared to be expensive, brand new winter coats and snow pants, and they all bore the recognizable Columbia logo. I had to restrain myself from grinning when I saw the anxious looks on their faces through the drawn and tightened hoods. They appeared to be dressed to hike the lower trails of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, not climb Everest. Tourists I assumed they were probably European, and this was likely their first experience with this type of weather. It was something that happened frequently. People travel from all over the world to these mountains to experience the breathtaking wilderness we offer. I wasn't being judgmental. If you weren't accustomed to the erratic winter weather here, it could easily catch you off guard and turn dangerous very quickly. Hello there. I smiled and stepped back into the doorway, motioning for them to enter. Enter from the snow and get cozy by the fire. The knocker turned to his companions and spoke to them in Spanish before turning back to me, grinning broadly and nodding before stepping past me and into the comfort of the station. The others quickly followed, eager to escape the chilly wind that was blowing vehemently outside. Once everyone was inside, I locked the door and closed it again to prevent it from opening accidentally. Thank you, sir. The man revealed his identity as Michael, unzipping his quilted down coat and pulling back his hood. He then made each of the other gestures. These are Diana, Jessica, Lucas, and Marco. I give each of them a greeting nod. Michael smiled and continued. It's freezing. We travel to the United States from Spain to see your stunning mountains and take in the breathtaking scenery. Although he had a heavy accent, I had little opportunity to criticize him because his English was much better than my Spanish. But a storm appears to be approaching, and we worry there will be too much snow. Sadly, we are not fully ready for that. I pat him on the shoulder and nodded as I passed by. I then opened the door to the shelter room, went inside, and turned on the lights. That's undoubtedly the case my friend. We might experience a little snow this evening, I'm afraid. It's too cold to take a winter hike through the mountains, I said. The good news is that we have enough room for you and your friends to settle in and wait out the storm. Eugene White, Ranger, is my name. There's coffee on the table over there, and inside are bunks and a cozy sitting area. I thought I had lost most of the group somewhere when. They just stood there and looked at me blankly for a while. I merely gestured toward the room and smiled as warmly as possible. They quickly shuffled past me, dropping their packs on various bunks and starting to take off their cold weather gear as they all grinned and nodded their appreciation. Before returning to my desk, I ensured everyone had something hot to drink and knew they could stay as long as they wanted until the weather improved. They all seemed very nice and appreciative of my help. As I continued with my administrative tasks, they slipped from my mind. It took another hour before the second knock on the door was heard. This knock was slower and oddly arrhythmic than the first, with almost a staccato beat. It was also less hesitant than the knocks from my other guests. I sighed long and stood up before turning around the counter and returning to the door. I hadn't had any visitors to the ranger station in the previous week or more. Still, they were pouring in as if this were a holiday in express. I unlocked the door and yanked it open, flashing my official greeting grin. A man about my height roughly six foot or so, stood in the doorway with his shoulders and hooded head covered in a thick layer of icy snow. In contrast to the others, he wore a mismatched ensemble that gave the impression that he had rummaged through a second-hand expedition store's clearance rack. 
He was also not dressed in fancy, color-coordinated cold-weather gear. His coat was fur-lined, made of padded wool, and layered over an old fleece jacket. His pants were blue-quilted nylon and looked more expensive, although they didn't fit him well. His boots appeared more recent and not overly warm. I assumed they were more appropriate for a summer hike than a winter in the mountains. I waved him inside and said as warmly as I could, Hey there. Coming from the snow, please. While walking past me, he said nothing but offered the tiniest nod. He left behind a potent body odor that made me wonder if he was a hermit who lived alone in a makeshift shack, as I had heard tales of such people. I turned back to the man and shut and locked the door once more. He entered the bunk room and sat on one of the vacant bunks in the back corner after noting the one to the left where the Spaniards were settling in. He didn't take off his coat or greet the others and I was a little curious to see that he wasn't carrying a pack. This made me wonder if he might have lived nearby in an off-the-grid cabin. He was sitting there quietly, watching the activity with dark eyes. At the same time, I could see the others smiling and introducing themselves to him. His lips had the tiniest trace of a smile, which was strange and unsettling. It didn't take them long to give up on trying to engage him in conversation and return to their group, where they began whispering in Spanish. I briefly considered whether he might be experiencing some sort of shock. Outside, the temperature was rapidly dropping, and some of his clothing had already become inadequate. I thought about checking him out quickly to ensure he had no frostbite or hypothermia symptoms. Still, something about him made me think he might not welcome my attention. I took a moment to survey the situation as I stood in the bunk room doorway. The newcomer somehow struck me as being off somehow. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but something about how he moved, maintained silence, and simply sat motionless on the corner bunk struck me as odd. There was also another thing. I had a hard time putting my finger on it. Something out of reach and piqued my curiosity was more of an instinctive unease than a thought. I found myself wishing the man would take a few minutes to warm up before continuing. My focus shifted to the others. I realized they must have noticed something strange about him as well because they had all unintentionally gathered at the end of the table furthest from him and spoke more subduedly than they had before. They would glance awkwardly in his direction now and then, but never for more than a split second as if they were just checking to make sure he hadn't moved and was still sitting there. Curiously, and probably also unconsciously, I observed that none of them sat with their backs to the man. I was about to approach and speak with him to dispel the strange feeling when Michael suddenly materialized in. Front of me, his brow furrowed. He said, Sir, myself and my friends are concerned about the other campers. This caught my eye. No campers had made reservations to be here today. The newcomer was one of them, right? They could have been in trouble. I scowled and asked, What campers? He made a hazy gesture northward. Before the weather forced us back to this location, we passed their campsite to the observation point. Perhaps half a kilometer up the trail, near a small brook, in a clearing. He quickly glanced back at the unknown person seated in the corner. I realized that the same unease was back. Michael went on. They numbered three, consisting of two men and a woman. As far as we could tell, they appeared well prepared for the storm and had some of those cold weather tents set up. We came to a stop and warmed ourselves briefly by their fire. I am not an expert, but they seemed knowledgeable and unconcerned about the cold. With the most reassuring smile I could muster, I said, well, it sounds like they should be okay. 
They should have contacted me, but they should be fine if they are as prepared as you believe. I'll go up there after the storm has passed and make sure they're okay. He glanced at the man once more before locking his eyes with mine with a startling intensity, as if he were trying to communicate with just his gaze. He said the campers were all dressed very nicely while lowering his voice. Jessica noticed that the camper's equipment was similar to that of her brother, who climbs in very cold climates. Then even better news, I began, but Michael interrupted me. He murmured, exactly like the pants that man is wearing now. I turned back to face the man, observing his jumbled array of attire once more. Even though they appeared to be well-made and appropriate for a mild autumn mounting, the gloves he was still wearing appeared to be thin and unsuitable for the winter weather. He was still standing there, silent, his emotionless eyes drifting slowly across the Spaniards with what, to my escalating paranoia, appeared to be a hungry interest. It appeared almost as though he was cataloging or assessing them somehow. That nagging feeling that something was off with the man returned to the back of my mind. I was still unable to identify what was slightly out of place. It made me grit my teeth. I turned to face Michael again. Are you certain? He made a shrug. We can be as sure as we can. Jessica claims to be certain but the rest of us lack the expertise to identify these particulars as well as she does. Did they include this man? I inquired, but I was aware of the response. Michael gave a head shake. No. I had never before seen him. He lowered his voice and leaned in a bit more. He stumbled over his words, this man, there is something then paused. I blinked. I know. Even I experience it. I returned to my desk, pulled open a drawer, removed the handgun from its holster, and fastened it to my belt. I tucked the extra magazine into my pocket, pulled my bulky jacket down from a nearby hook, and covered my ears with my fur-lined hat. Michael followed me while keeping an eye on me. I checked behind him to ensure we were out of the bunk room's line of sight and sound. Let me see how the camp is doing. Do you have any experience with shotguns? I queried. He gave the nod. Every year, I go pheasant hunting with my cousins. I am an excellent shooter. Good, I replied. My room is through the doorway next to my desk. A loaded but unchambered 12-gauge pump is located right inside. If you require it, he only silently nodded his head. I'll be back in an hour or so. I'm familiar with the location you're referring to. I said, closing my coat and ensuring the zippered slit covering my holster was open and accessible. Keep him here until I return, but don't do anything if you don't have to. Eugene White, exercise caution. I sensed some gloom in the air. I simply nodded, lips pursed, before I flung open the door and stepped outside into the wind. My heavy pants were cut through by the icy chill, which quickly penetrated every crevice in my clothing. The wind howled in my ears and buffeted me constantly out here. Although the snow was only about ankle-deep along the trail, it pulled at my boots with each step, slowing my progress. One of the few marked campsites in this part of the trail, the location Michael had described, did not strictly require campers to check in before setting up, but it was highly recommended. The rangers were everyone's only true lifeline in this remote area of the woods, 20 miles from the closest town. The fact that you registered with the nearby ranger station may very well mean the difference between life and death if anything goes wrong. But that didn't mean that everyone adhered to that rule. 
The majority of the time, new campers, those people lacking some experience and wisdom, were the ones who were unaware of or didn't believe it was necessary to check in before setting up camp. Sometimes, it was the complete opposite. Some extremely skilled outdoor enthusiasts believed there was no need because they could handle any situation that arose. Whatever the case, a growing unease started to color my steps as I traveled that northern trail. My every breath tickled under the tight grip of anxiety. I had no idea what I would uncover. If lucky, I'd come across three silicone nylon, double wall, cold weather tents with their occupants snugly inside. If that were the case, I would check on them before returning to my post, hopefully, before the storm's worst started in earnest. If not, I'd have to determine that when the time came. After a half hour, I arrived at the campsite. With their bright red material shredded, torn, and violently flapping in the ferocious wind, the remains of three high-quality winter tents were arranged compactly around a central fire pit. They resembled a crazy array of flags in the eye of a hurricane. My hat's ears were lowered as I tightened the chin strap. Hello? I yelled while trying to raise my voice above the wind. It sounded pitifully helpless in the roar of the impending storm, even with all of my strength. Is there anyone here? I waited for a while, but all I could hear was the wind's rush and the whip-like snap of the nylon fabric. Although I hadn't seen a bear in months and had never heard of a bear attack in this area, the campsite had all the telltale signs of a bear attack. We didn't have brown bears here, unlike in the forests of the west. There were black bears but they were much smaller and less hostile than large brown bears. Yes, they were potentially dangerous, especially if startled or threatened, but they didn't go out looking for people. I moved a little further into the campsite while drawing the Sig Sauer 10 millimeters and keeping it at low ready, and quickly performing a visual inspection of the tents. Nothing. There were no traces of bodies, blood, a struggle, or anything else. Just destroyed tents that the campers might have abandoned when the wind picked up and the fabric started to break down. It then caught my attention. Between two tents was a flash of dark gray partly obscured by the snow. I would have missed it had it continued to snow for another ten minutes. I approached the frozen bundle of cloth, towed it over and then picked it up with my free hand while keeping the sig ready. It was a pair of heavy winter pants that looked too new to be comfortable, as they were old, torn, and covered in deep red-brown stains. They appeared to be woolen and were fur-lined. When the wind blew a recognizable musky smell into my face as I lifted them out of the snow, I immediately dropped them in disgust. I was drawn to the blue tinge in the white drift two feet further and cautiously approached. I recognized the puffy material of a cold weather jacket. When I reached out to expose more of it, I staggered backward in shock, realizing suddenly that I was looking at a crudely dismembered arm, still wrapped snugly in its warm jacket sleeve. I yelled and stumbled backward tripping over the stones around the fire pit and landing hard on my ass. My eyes were wide open, and I didn't even notice how painful it was for my tailbone to hit the icy ground. I sat there, hyperventilating, for what felt like minutes, long enough that the frigid chill was settling into my legs and backside from where I sat dumbly in the snow, eyes wide and breath ragged. I didn't realize I was holding the handgun as tightly as I could and aiming madly at the gray mass of frozen pants in front of me as though they were going to suddenly come to life and attack until my arms started to shake. Shit, was all I could think as rationality suddenly returned, clearing the pulsating red spots from my vision and jamming my thoughts back to the present jarringly. My ears pounding started to lessen, and the winds. 
relentless scream again took place. I leaped to my feet and started running back along the trail, back to my station, where Michael, Lucas, Marco, Jessica, and the other girl, whose name I couldn't remember, sheltered from the coming storm with, with what? Was he some sort of psycho serial killer stalking the lonely hiking trails of upstate New York? That wasn't logical in any way. In my three years here, I had never heard of anything comparable. I remembered those gray pants left behind in the campsite as I stumbled through the snow, which was now halfway up my shin. They had been torn and ripped from wear and age and shredded. Something violent caused the damage, and the bloodstains seemed to lend credence to that theory. So, whatever had happened, the stranger had decided to replace his damaged and stained pants with what? Those of his victims? Then I noticed that none of his outfits matched, and that his boots and gloves weren't even appropriate for the cold weather. Since when had this been happening? Twenty minutes later, out of the near whiteout conditions that had engulfed me with the full approach of the storm, the faint yellow lights from the windows of my station suddenly appeared. I was astounded that, propelled by adrenaline and fear, I had maintained my pace long enough to return despite the lower temperature. I came to a stop in front of my ranger station and immediately noticed that the front door was slightly ajar. My mind pushed me forward and told me to rush in, but I needed a few seconds to collect myself and allow my heartbeat to slow down before I did. If the door hadn't been locked, the first strong wind gust would have blown it wide open and banged against the wood paneling of the wall behind it. So why was the door only open a few finger widths? But the implications of that open door were what kept me up much later. Nobody inside could have missed it, and no one with a sense of reason would have sat in the station as the icy wind and snow blew in through the open doorway. However, I set that aside and moved toward the door as quietly as possible. I pushed it at first gently, but as I sensed some resistance to keep it shut, I pushed it harder. My finger rested along the pistol's frame as I held my sidearm firmly in my hands, muzzle facing forward in a chest level. I was ready to pull the trigger and start working instantly. Fortunately, the building's protests and the wind's howling provided enough cacophony to mask the sounds of my entrance, causing the door to gradually give way and push inward until it was wide enough for me to slide through. I entered the building and immediately found myself in a fever nightmare. A body used as a temporary barricade was lying behind the door. The fact that the head and upper torso had been savagely dismembered and the skin and scalp had been viciously torn away from the red white of the skull could only have indicated that it was one of the women based on the delicate shape of the body. She had likely been trying desperately to flee from whatever hell had been after her at the time. Nearly every surface in my immediate vicinity was covered in hot, copper-smelling blood. I could hear tearing sounds coming from the bunk room. The hanging bulb in the room center was swinging maniacally as if it had been struck and was still settling into its pendulum motion. The lights in the space flickered erratically. With a fresh shock rushing through my body and a cold wash threatening my consciousness, I dipped into the room as quietly as possible. The room was littered with bodies and pieces of bodies, many of which were still covered in clothing glued in place with gooey red. Whatever horrifying act of violence had taken place, the heat from the bodies lying around like abandoned playthings in the room was palpable. I noticed some empty shotgun shells at my feet where they had dropped and become stuck in the thick blood staining the floorboards. Only a few inches separated the barely recognizable remains of the man I had known as Michael from the shotgun's chamber, which was open, and its magazine tube, which was empty. His ravaged corpse was covered in terrible slashes and wounds, giving the impression that he had been thrown into a shredder. 
His limbs were spread out and only connected by the pink and yellow muscles and tendons that now lay open and exposed. When I turned to look at the source of the previous sounds, I could tell it was Lucas because of the bright yellow Columbia jacket he was wearing and the way he was straddling one of the bodies. I watched in horror as the stranger repeatedly dipped his head, jerking it violently each time it came back up as if ripping more pieces of meat away with each motion. Then, I noticed that the stranger's hands had somehow expanded, lengthened, and acquired a shiny chitinous appearance, leaving the fingers to resemble jagged, blood-smeared claws. My reflexes took over after a brief period of shocked hesitation. I quickly snapped my handgun's muzzle up and depressed the trigger. As I watched blackened holes appear in the thing's back, I barely noticed the 10 mm thunderous blasts, which I know must have been deafening. It threw its head back in what I can only assume was pain and screamed incoherently, drowning everything around it. I pulled the trigger again, and another bullet ripped through the terrifying object. The strange creature exploded up from where it had been feasting almost faster than I could follow, lighting upon the wall with its terrible claws sinking into the wood and holding it in place as it turned its head 180 degrees to face me. The skin at the corners of its mouth was pulled back in a hideous grin that nearly reached from ear to ear, exposing a mouthful of sharp like triangular teeth now stained bright red. The eyes had turned completely black and grown to the size of golf balls, and the jaw almost separated from its skull. The moment it tensed, it leaped to the next wall and clung to the exposed wood like some monstrous insect with its eyes fixed on me. Before it could move again, I repeatedly fired, miraculously getting my shot most of the time as empty brass cases ejected against the doorframe next to me and rang out like death bells. Its black eyes were fixed on me for a lengthy period of silent stillness in the space, remaining unsettlingly icy and foreign. I tensed up, expecting the thing to charge at me, but it was obvious I'd heard it. I'm not sure how badly, but my hollow points dozen puncture wounds were dripping with black ichor, and I thought I heard a sickening rattling in its slow, deep breaths. It leaped again, away from me and through the window at the back of the room, with one last ear-splitting, otherworldly shriek. The moment the glass broke outward, everything ended. With only the remains of the five Spanish tourists and the unsettling knowledge that my handgun slide was locked back, smoke was lazily billowing from the barrel. The magazine was empty. I stood by myself in this rundown house. I moved from field operations to an administrative position with the Park Service since then, which was almost a year ago. My office is in the middle of the city, surrounded by people, and there isn't a lonesome wood or a pitch-black desert in sight. I attempted to resume my posting after the investigation concluded and the deaths were classified as animal predation, but I could not. I believed I could pass the new station after demolishing the old one to make room for one closer to the trailhead. Still, I kept seeing that strange creature every time I closed my eyes. I had a few moments where I thought I could hear that banshee wail echoing in the night's pitch-black silence. I believe I heard more than one at least once or twice. I locked the doors and slept with my handgun on the nightstand and my shotgun beside my bed. I had the nagging feeling it was still out there. Possibly trying to find me. Perhaps it wanted to prevent me from telling anyone about it. You see... Ever since that awful night, I've searched the internet for any explanation I could find for what I saw. I sought the advice of any self-styled cryptozoologist or paranormal investigator who would talk to me. Still, no one had any logical explanations besides folklore and urban legends. I always came away with just as many questions as when I arrived. And then, one day... 
I came across an article that fundamentally altered my life. It was an article about a concept known as the Uncanny Valley, which was advanced by a Japanese roboticist in the 1970s. I nearly ignored it initially because it mostly concerned robots and computer graphics and how people become uncomfortable as they become more resemblant to real humans. But then I came across a theory explaining why people might behave this way and how it might be an evolutionary holdover from our reptilian ancestors still lurking in the recesses of our minds. About the possibility that there may have once existed predators who resembled humans at some point in our distant common racial history. They might have resembled our ancestors so much that they blended in with us almost perfectly. The idea is that as a survival mechanism, early humans may have evolved a keen sense of facial recognition. This may have been passed down genetically fading slightly with each generation until it was reduced to a simple instinctual warning when we noticed someone who didn't seem quite right. Someone who appeared almost normal but might have the tiniest flaw that gave them a slightly off appearance. Someone who wasn't one of us but who our guts told us didn't belong. I question whether these things have always been around, lurking among us and pursuing us from within our numbers. Yesterday, I saw a young woman sitting by herself in the back of the subway car on my way to work. The seats next to her were empty, even though it was crowded. I observed that the other passengers almost appeared to be trying to avoid getting too close to her. Nobody seemed to be consciously aware of it, but I noticed that people kept glancing uncomfortably at her. Nothing about her was obviously out of place so it could have been a coincidence that no one chose to sit beside her. But I just couldn't eliminate the sensation that something was off. This all happened years ago. I'm fine now and safe and sound at home. But getting here took a while. And it'll be a while before I feel like myself again. Maybe I won't ever. It all began like any other week at summer camp. The camp counselor said in a loud, friendly voice, Okay, you kids are with me. Starting now, the eight of you are a team. The Ohio squad. He gave us red armbands to stand out from the other campers. I experienced an absurd moment of pride as we started putting them over our shirt sleeves. The Buckeye squad appeared to be powerful. Any other group I could think of would struggle to compete with us. On the first day of sleepaway summer camp, the counselors introduced us to our bunks for the upcoming week. We all carried our bags inside the large wagon's creaking back door after he unlocked it, looked around the bare interior for a while, and then settled in. The camp's name was Circle Wagon Ranch. It featured an Old West theme, horses for trail rides, swimming, archery, and many other activities. We would be sleeping in what appeared to be old frontier wagons rather than cabins or tents. Each wagon could accommodate eight children with two bunk beds on each side. I also noticed that they were extremely warm inside. The only source of ventilation was the front door which couldn't be propped open because there were no windows. It's like an oven in here, one of the other kids said before I could get the words out. I reflected that we appeared to be spending most of that week outside. We hurriedly exited the wagon and returned to the breeze. The sun above suddenly didn't feel as hot to me. Instead, feeling the breeze on my face was just pleasant. Feeling the cool wind blowing in from the forest to the west was coming. Man, that's scorching hot. The child beside me said, We're never going to be able to sleep in there. He was roughly the same height as me, making him tall for his age. He smiled amiably at me while donning a red shirt and cargo shorts. Yeah, 
I'm hoping it cools off overnight. Hey, by the way, my name is Dean. No way. That is also my name. I couldn't stop laughing. Even though Dean is a common name, it felt unexpected to run into another Dean as soon as I arrived at summer camp. Except for our names, we were almost complete opposites. He had black hair, and I had blonde hair. His clothing was dark compared to my bright, light attire. Later, I would wish I had never encountered the second Dean. A crazy, chaotic version of myself. But for the moment, it appeared that we would become fast friends. I shook his hand after he extended it. Dean asked me singly, Do you enjoy pulling pranks on people? I was alarmed by the look in his eyes. While the other eye remained fixed on my face, the other looked away. I wasn't sure why at the time, but he made me uneasy. His tone was off, and his grin was a bit too broad. I nervously replied, Yeah, who doesn't like pranks, while scanning the area for any nearby adults? There wasn't any. They had all abruptly vanished. You'd be surprised, I'm sure. Some individuals lack a sense of humor. But I can tell that you share my sense of humor. Dean, we're going to have a good time this week, he said, flashing what might have been a smile. We're going to have a ton of fun. Sure, that's true. I replied, turning my gaze away from him. I'm looking forward to it too. A moment later, I moved over to try to make friends with another group of kids. Still, it appeared that I had missed the opportunity. I sidestepped as casually as I could. Everyone had split up into groups of two or three, and Dean and I were the only ones left. It would just be him and me for the rest of the week. The following day, the other Dean began pulling pranks. At first, they seemed okay, and I'll admit that I initially agreed with them. If only I didn't want to aggravate him. In addition, they were initially crude, juvenile jokes. I could see that Dean had prepared to wreak havoc on the camp and its occupants because he had brought supplies from home for these uses. Smaller things were in the beginning like adding salt to the camp counselor's sugar shaker in the mess hall. We observed the bitter expressions on their faces as they sipped their morning coffee, spit it out, stood up, and searched the area for the brats who had ruined their breakfast. We both averted our eyes and pretended to be casually eating. Then, he displayed the plastic spiders and snakes he had. Brought from home in his duffel bag, filled to the brim with them. He hid them in campers' shoes and under counselors' pillows before running through the entire collection as they were taken away individually. When those were all gone, he showed me the thumbtacks, silly spray, whoopee cushions, and stink bombs he had brought. He covered the toilet bowls with cling wrap so that the water would splash everywhere when people flushed. He never ceased to amaze me with inventive ways to harass the other campers just when I thought he had run out of supplies. By the middle of the week, everyone knew that someone was instigating this chaos, but they were unsure who it was. Since even the other Buckeye Squad members were in the dark about my involvement in these little jokes, I felt a little giddy. Yes, they were childish, stupid pranks. But I reminded myself that at least nobody was hurt. Not yet, at least. But suspicion was growing among the populace. Now that everyone was on their toes, it was getting harder and harder to get away with these little pranks and gags. We're going to get caught pretty soon, I told Dean one morning as we stood outside the Buckeye wagon, waiting for breakfast to start. Perhaps we ought to take a day off. Let the temperature drop a little. 
I was still having a good time at this point. I had no idea how dire things would turn out to be. True pranksters don't take vacation days, Dean. That ought to be obvious by now. I was curious as to what he would do with the toothpaste and toothbrush he was innocently holding in his hands. He had a glint in his eyes that told me I would learn the truth soon enough. He indicated one of the other wagons and said, Go knock on their door. The cowboys, a green group, were responsible. What are you planning to do? I inquired with suspicion. He instructed me, just do it, with a serious, almost mean look in his eyes. I sighed and nodded before approaching the wagon and rapping on the door. Dean remained hidden outside with his back to the wall and his face toward me so that when the door opened, it would swing to cover him if it didn't smack him in the face. With his back to the wall, he patiently waited and watched me closely. Hey, what's up? A sleepy ad camper said when he opened the door. The other Dean, who had moved behind it and was now invisible, was hidden by its wide swing. I was taken by surprise. What I was going to say had not occurred to me. Morning! You guys possess a... Can I borrow a towel from you? Mine disappeared. He said, one second and moved away. I couldn't help but wonder what Dean was doing behind the door a few feet away as I stood there. With him standing there, it was challenging to act otherwise. I was certain that we would be discovered. When he returned, I took the towel from the child and thanked him, saying I would return with it. We two snuck out of the wagon as the door shut behind us. Nobody, not me, had seen what Dean did behind the open door. One down, two to go, declared Dean, grinning sarcastically. I started to realize what his ridiculous plan was. Still, other than how he was going about it, it didn't seem particularly clever. It was just another annoyance like the cling wrap and the salt and the sugar shakers. One more thing to make the other campers hostile toward us. Akin to wanting them to despise him. And to despise us. The fun began about ten minutes later. At least what Dean considered to be enjoyable. What in the world is this? One child shouted, toothpaste, with his hands covered in bluish-white goo. Aw. What the- Another kid shook his hand off, flinging toothpaste everywhere. When the campers grabbed the door handle to open it, toothpaste flew everywhere, staining their shirt sleeves and pants. Dean had managed to coat the inside of each sleeper wagon's front door handle with toothpaste. They could not wash their hands or clothes because there was no running water beside the main building. It was not a particularly clever ruse, as I previously stated. But it was still effective. The campers were all in a rage. Not only had they fallen for another prank, but this one had been set up in broad daylight. They had all been entering and exiting the wagons all morning, so I couldn't help but think it was pretty cunning and was slightly concerned we would be discovered. With the mess, it appeared that more than one. Camper had ruined one or more articles of clothing, and I suddenly felt bad for being the distraction. A moment later, when a member of the Buckeye team entered our wagon and yelled indignantly, I realized Dean had used the same covert method on our wagon to hide our tracks. Every wagon's door handle, including ours, had been modified by him. Who's doing these stupid pranks, yelled Brian, a blonde-haired kid with toothpaste all over his bright orange shirt. The hoodie appeared pricey and had a name-brand design on the front, which my parents could never have afforded. Because Brian was well-liked by the other campers, support for him quickly grew. 
He had spent years going to Circle Wagon Ranch every summer. His family allegedly knew the property's owners personally. Those Dean children, someone responded, directing their response at us. That person knocked on my door and asked for a towel. Moments later, this incident occurred. A second later, they were all around us like an angry mob, and Dean quickly objected. Hey, hold on. We took no action. Look, even our wagon has it. The Lone Star Gang, if anyone, was responsible. They weren't played, as you can see. It must be one of them. I was astounded to see that the plan had succeeded. We had been able to focus all our attention on them by ignoring the one wagon. The other campers murmured uncertainly and back and forth to one another. Well, I suppose that's true. Okay, perhaps it wasn't you guys. Except for Brian, they all appeared to agree. He didn't seem to be persuaded. He remained, keeping a wary eye on us as the others started to leave. You two seem to think you're pretty smart, huh? I guess I'm not as stupid as all of them, he muttered. I know you did that to divert their attention from you. I know you two have been spewing this idiotic bill all week. Next time, I will catch you in the act and make sure you leave immediately. You assholes ruined my best shirt with toothpaste. I'm going to make sure you pay now. He turned around and walked away, wiping his stained shirt with his sticky blue hands. I was aware from prior experience that nothing would get that shit out. Dean put his hand up for a high five and laughed when he was no longer audible. We've got him, man. That was a complete success. After giving him a flimsy high five, I glanced at my shoes. I didn't feel like celebrating, instead, I wanted to puke. And once more, I wished I had made friends at camp with anyone besides the other Dean. The following day was sweltering, so we all hiked to the river to cool off. It took an hour to get there, so we marched through forests while dodging mosquitoes. I was surprised to see a river surrounded by cliffs on one side and a forest on the other when we finally came across some water. While some of us stayed behind to swim, others set off to climb the hills and make their way to the tops of the cliffs. After Dean and I had temporarily split up, I found a smaller group that, even though I was from a different squad, had reluctantly accepted me. It was easier to socialize with the other kids that day because it was just a day trip and no competitive activities were scheduled. I was glad to have a reason to get away from Dean. With this group of kids, I scaled one of the cliffs to its highest point where I discovered their names as Tom, Joe, and Brett. Joe questioned us as we hung our legs off the cliff's edge and gazed down into the deep blue river below. What's up with that other guy you're always hanging out with? We replied. What are you saying? Man, he's weird as hell. Brian believes he is the one pulling all the pranks on the group. Sincerely, we believe you are aware of it. But as I get to know you, you seem to be a decent enough person. I hesitated and then said, I dunno. He's strange. I wasn't interested in being his friend. We essentially just started hanging out together. I looked for another way to explain, but I was unsuccessful. I knew he wasn't a good guy. I might just have needed to be upfront about it. The camp counselors called us back down to the swimming area as I was about to say something else. I'm not sure what exactly. It was time to return to the campsite. Whenever I looked for Dean, he was noticeably absent and nowhere to be found. It gave me the creeps. Like a wolf, he hid in the shadows and trees where I couldn't see him. 
But even so, I was glad that I didn't have to spend some time with him. He was starting to irritate me. That night, as we were all gathered around the campfire singing songs, Dean suddenly materialized beside me. He whispered something in my ear as our voices rose high into the atmosphere. You need to check this out, dude. I found it in the woods. I didn't want to go with him, but he wouldn't listen to no. He insisted that I simply had to see this thing. He had never seen anything more incredible. I hadn't considered him to be dangerous at that point. Sure, just a little eccentric and strange. But not harmful. I figured he might have discovered some sort of secret loot. After all, I was a child, and I had no idea better. He appeared very enthusiastic about whatever it was, and the mud and dirt on his face and clothes suggested that he had been digging. I finally gave in and snuck off into the woods with him. Behind us, the camper's song started to fade away into the distance before becoming nothing more than a memory. Still, we trudged onward through the pitch black forest. What is our destination? It's taking so long. We're going to have problems. I groaned, wishing he would grow weary of my groaning and give in to my insistence that he turn around. But he obstinately kept going, disregarding me. I crouched next to him to get a better look at his face and noticed that his eyes were fixed far in the distance, almost as if he were hypnotized. Dean? I questioned him firmly. Dean! When he finally turned to face me, he appeared to have just awoken from a pleasant dream. He had his eyes half closed and was feigning a smile. Are we close now? I'm worn out. I want to return. The sound came from the nearby forest, not too far off the path. It sounded like an animal in pain. We are unable to turn around at this time. We've arrived. He questioned me, his smile growing. Don't you want to see? Come on, I'll demonstrate. He took my arm and guided me deeper into the forest over a ridge. A shape was slumped up ahead by an oak tree's wide trunk. As we drew nearer, I became aware it was moving, heaving up and down as if someone were weeping. What is this? The words left my mouth, but it sounded like they were coming from a very far distance. I moved closer to the body while stumbling through the mud and leaves on numb legs. Brian's here! Dean yelled behind me, or, at the very least, what's left of him. It wasn't until then that I realized. On the hike earlier, I had been so focused on looking for Dean that I had failed to notice Brian's absence. The same amount of time had passed since he left. Even the camp counselors were unaware of it. I turned around the tree to get a better look at his face, and then I realized what was making him whimper. The boy had suffered at the hands of Dean. Blood was dripping from the wounds cut into his face and all over his body leaving him unrecognizable. He barely held onto the last thread of life, breathing in shallow wheezes. His lips, nose, eyelids, and fingernails were all missing, as well as his ears. Nearby, both of his legs were piled up like firewood. Dean quietly asked, looking at me with one misaligned eye, aren't you happy? In my entire life, I had never felt more terrified. We can now carry on having fun. Nobody is going to stand in our way. Why would you harm him in this way? Inching back, I questioned. Why in the world would you think that I would desire this? You are a psychopath. Get the hell away from me, you freak. At that word, his eyes grew dark, his brows furrowed. And suddenly, he appeared very angry. 
Dean is no longer the silly trickster I used to be friends with. He now had a convincing ability to commit the terrible acts I had just witnessed. You don't mean that he murmured inwardly. Say you didn't intend it. Claim to be my friend. Say that you want it. You're insane, I say. I turned and made a few steps in my attempt to run before feeling myself trip over a root. My jaw painfully snapped shut as I hit the ground after falling over forcefully, and it hurt more than any pain I'd ever experienced. All I could think was that my jaw was broken as I struggled to scream but could not. I slowly rose to my feet and started to feel uneasy about what would happen next. The sound of him running behind me and over the crunching leaves caught my attention. He was roaring like a bear and breathing heavily and quickly. I felt something hit me hard in the back of the head and I collapsed to the ground. Before everything turned black, I could still recall tasting dirt on my tongue and between my teeth. When I opened my eyes, strange events were going on all around me. I immediately noticed that we were still in a forest. The other dean was conversing with several police officers covered in a blanket. He was pointing at me while crying and expressing his fear while his face was red. Sick freak, someone uttered. I whirled around to see Joe. The two friends I had made when the other dean wasn't around, Tom and Brett, were standing with him. Brett hissed, I can't believe you killed him. Guy did not harm you in any way. To understand what the heck was going on, my mind was racing. Then I understood. He blamed me for everything. When I attempted to speak, it felt like someone was hammering a nail into my jaw. The suffering was unbearable. I don't know much about these things, but I recall that my uncle once broke his jaw and had to have it wired shut while it healed. He was unable to speak for weeks. And I couldn't either. I tried listening to Dean's conversation as my heart rate accelerated. The other Dean remarked, he kept pushing it further and further. He initially told me it would only be small practical jokes, but things kept worsening. He brought everything from home, including cling wrap, fake spiders, and fireworks. It seemed relatively harmless to me. But this now! You must believe me when I say I would have told you guys what he would do if I had known. He was crying while making a great show of it for the adults. I nearly bought into it myself, but I was aware of what he had done. I had personally witnessed it. Brian, where are you? I attempted to yell. He attempted to murder him. He attempted to murder me. But nothing audible emitted, save for a muffled clicking and my subsequent scream as I was being strangled. The agony of trying to speak was terrible. The policeman told me, shut up, freak, without showing any pity. He then turned to face the other dean. You're almost done, kid. You're doing fantastic. One more thing, please. How did his face look? Did you see him harm himself in that way? The corners of my mouth were where I first felt it. A pain that I was previously unaware of. An excruciating, burning agony. It was exquisite, but the fractured jaw outweighed it so much that I hadn't noticed it until then. And distinct from other types of pain, my mouth's corners had been slashed with a knife blade on both sides. Like the smile of the Joker, upward. He merely stated that he needed to laugh more about the jokes because he found them hilarious. He wanted to laugh indefinitely, said Dean. The officer replied, shaking his head, geez. You did a good job informing the adults about this. 
Do you now have any inquiries for me? The other dean seriously considered this before carefully formulating his next query. Will you be able to have guests? I mean in prison. Would you like to see the accused? Suspicious, the officer inquired. Dean smiled while keeping one eye on the police officer and the other on me. No doubt. We're close pals. You are aware of the adage. Best friends last a lifetime. Even if they are slightly insane. I came across it while conducting routine park patrols in a remote area. The modest but distinct cave entrance. I wasted no time pulling out my flashlight and moving towards the smaller, manageable cave, opening wide enough to step through without crouching because it wasn't on the maps. It was my job to check things like that out. The cave was situated next to a pond in a clearing. The opening looked fairly unremarkable and was situated in the center of a sandstone wall. There was no indication that it was hazardous or unusual. That indicated that the cave had never been made into a mine because the opening was only just large enough for several people to pass through. No trash or other signs of recent human activity were present either. Therefore, I might have been the first to know how long it takes to enter this cave. The sensation was accompanied by an exhilaration I had never experienced before. I took a deep breath, turned on my extra powerful flashlight, and slowly entered. I was extremely cautious in the cave during my first few steps. The terrain was very steep, in addition to the fact that I had never been here before. It continued slowly sinking deeper into the ground, which you could feel. I cast the flashlight beam around, ensuring I didn't fall and lose my balance. Because the darkness inside the cave was unlike anything I had ever seen, despite the intense glaring light it provided. I had spent many nights in the woods before, but this was much worse. This gloom was thick. The descent grew smoother, and the ground leveled out after a sufficient number of cautious steps. The cave floor was uneven in places and smooth in others. Where the elements had worn away portions of the land and created a smoother walking path, you could tell. It was also much cooler down here, and I could now make out the impressive stalactites and stalagmites all over the cave. There wasn't much room to move around here, but the uneven path that had replaced the difficult descent had been replaced. More than that couldn't fit through, only a small group could. The cave floor was bare except for the occasional crunch of gravel beneath my boots. Nearly uncannily tidy. You can't help but feel unimportant in the grand scheme of things when you see how untouched the cave is. Not only was the cave much older than I was, but it would continue to exist long after I was gone especially considering how endless the cave seemed. I felt like I was doing absolutely nothing but exploring more and more. According to my watch, I had been down there for about an hour when the huge chamber was revealed at the end of the winding path, which caused me to gasp. Water filled the entire area, and the walkway was a temporary bridge to reach the other side. Nearly everywhere you turned, the walls were jagged and rough. Although the cave had many impressive stalactites, those hanging from the ceiling here were enormous. It appeared impossible that they had formed naturally because they were so precise and sharp-looking. Some were almost in contact with the water covering the area. Although I had no idea how deep the water was, it appeared very deep in the pitch blackness. The walkway that connected the two sides of the cavern got rougher here, but it continued to appear steady and worn as before. I, therefore, started to slowly cross the cavern while paying closer attention to my footing than ever. 
I was almost halfway across when a rock struck a cavern wall and splashed into the water. I nearly jumped because the sound in the empty room seemed so unnaturally loud. After ensuring I was on solid ground, I cautiously checked with the flashlight. Nothing was present. No indication that anything had occurred at all. On this job, however, you learn that just because something appears in order doesn't mean nothing else is. My next back hair stood up, telling me everything I needed to know. I was afraid to advance any further. If anything, I was carefully adjusting my balance to go back. When I heard it, I was about to turn around and go back the way I came. The whispered conversation sounds. I was initially unsure of what it was. Until this point, the only sounds I had heard were my footsteps. I slowly crossed the cavern as a chill washed over me. I'm unsure if it was just in my head, but the whispering grew louder as I moved. The voice's vague familiarity was what made it the most. Unsettling. It wasn't enough for me to recognize it, but disturbing enough. The worst part was that I was completely oblivious to the source of the voice. Due to the cave's acoustics, the voice seemed everywhere and nowhere at once. When I cast my flashlight around and spotted it, I almost reached the cavern's opposite end. A shadow was in the middle of the pitch black water on the cavern's left side. I carefully turned and pointed the flashlight's beam at it while my heart was racing and my hands were sweaty. The shape was just as dark as before the flashlight, but the water was a murky gray. I didn't know what shape it was. It was solid, but it was neither an animal nor even remotely human looking. It was just hanging there, floating barely above the water. I would have assumed it was trash a blanket, or some clothing that fell into the water if there had been even the slightest indication of human activity here. But I was aware that was untrue. My stomach twisted at the sight. My flashlight was still pointed directly at it when it suddenly vanished. The water wasn't moving or otherwise disturbed. It just disappeared. That was my signal to go. I ran out of there as fast as possible due to the numerous rock formations I had to navigate around once I was safe across the cavern and on solid ground. It appeared to take a very long time. Although there was never anything there when I checked behind me to make sure, I couldn't eliminate the feeling that someone or something was watching me. Finally, after an agonizingly long time, I returned to the cave entrance. The next challenge was to navigate what was essentially an uphill climb. The climb did nothing to alleviate the sweat I was already drenched in. But by being cautious about my steps, I eventually found myself at the cave's entrance, where daylight was streaming in. I stepped out into the sunshine with thanks and peered into the cave. I swear I saw a figure walk by on the cave floor below as I was doing this. But when I turned around, it vanished. After collecting myself, I radioed the station to report the cave discovery, and a few other rangers arrived to investigate. My boss, Jack, was one of them. I told them I hadn't seen anything, but they could tell something wasn't right by looking at me and my demeanor. Jack was accustomed to the strange situations park rangers can and do experience while on the job. I, therefore, told him, as well as the other two rangers, what I had seen and experienced inside the cave. When I was finished, Jack remained still for a while. In his deep, steady voice, he said, Things go bump in the night whether it's 2022 or 1822. I don't object, I mumbled. Wait, I'm certain you don't. I won't pretend to have seen what you did, but I think you did. The outdoors can be and frequently is a very scary place. 
I'm not kidding. The other ranger concurred. There's a reason this cave appeared to be uninhabited. Also, no sign of animals. None. At that, Jack shook his head. That's a red flag that something is wrong. If animals won't approach something, neither should people. So we'll log the find, return to base, and mark this cave as dangerous. Now let's leave the area. The real-life events surrounding 32-year-old prostitute Lily Lindstrom, who was murdered on May 4, 1954, in her cramped apartment in Stockholm, Sweden's Atlas neighborhood close to Sankt Eriksplan, are the inspiration for this tale. Her skull had been crushed, she had been dead for a few days, and the detectives had discovered that someone had been consuming her blood. The vampire murder case or the Atlas vampire are well known worldwide. Numerous alleged vampires have committed horrific crimes and been apprehended while confessing their crimes and desires. This case is still unsolved in the long list of alleged vampire killers and barely registers. Lily was her name, and she resided in Stockholm, Sweden. She lived in a charming, old house in the Atlas neighborhood. She had a wonderful life, going out almost every night and meeting interesting people. She started working as a part-time prostitute when she ran out of money. Everything was going well for a few days after she started doing it, but on May 1st, strange things started to happen. That evening, as she fumbled in the dark for the light switch after arriving home late, her hand brushed up against something cold and plush in the center of the room. She frantically searched the wall for the light, but when she did, there was nothing to be found. After feeling uneasy, she sat down on the couch to gather her thoughts, but then an intense headache started to pound in her head. Though she had never experienced a migraine before, she assumed this was one and largely forgot how she felt at night. She awoke the following morning feeling drained and worn out. Although her headache had mostly subsided, she noticed a noticeable bump on her forehead when she looked in the mirror. She tried to ignore the incident, saying she must have simply hit her head while dozing off. She left as she had intended to. That evening, she arrived at her house late once more, and because of last night, she felt a little afraid. She hurried to find the light. She felt foolish for continuing to worry since everything was going according to plan. She watched reruns on television while concentrating on getting sleepy. The headache from the previous night suddenly returned, but it was much worse this time. Her skull was throbbing, and the pain was so intense that she thought she might taste blood in the back of her throat. The headache didn't go away as the night went on, it became even worse. She drank some water before getting a painkiller but it tasted odd and almost metallic. She spits it into the sink and then gawks horrifiedly at it. She sipped the water but found a pool of red blood swirling down the drain. She stepped back and examined her mouth for signs of a cut or a logical cause for the blood in the sink. She looked around for one and looked more and more disturbed. Swallowing helped lessen the metallic aftertaste but her headache only worsened. As it intensified, it pressed against the backs of her eyelids, causing her vision to become foggy. She perceived what appeared to be a tall, pale man standing in the center of the kitchen's haze. She heard a woman wailing in ecstasy as he approached her, but the cries soon changed to screams of terror and pain. She stumbled back into the living room, terrified, and collapsed on the ottoman amid the sounds of anguish and fear. She barely succeeded when she tried to explain the previous night's events as a headache-induced nightmare when she woke up the following morning. 
the bump on her forehead had gotten bigger and felt so real. She visited a few more tourist attractions because she wanted to leave the hotel room and forget about it. Still, she couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching her. She left for home earlier that evening to avoid another unsettling encounter. She received a call from her friend Minnie asking her to come over at around 7 o'clock in the evening. Minnie hung up the phone without waiting for a response and said she would be there. When Minnie arrived upstairs, she rapped on the door. When the phone rang again, Lily let her in, and they began chatting like old friends do after about 30 minutes. Lily confidently responded, hoping the caller was a customer of her recently successful company. The voice was male. She was asked if she was Lily. Lily was happy to accept Minnie's advice to invite him because she felt it couldn't hurt. Lily exclaimed as he entered through the door. He was tall and pasty white, almost like the hazy figure she'd seen the previous evening. Still, he was friendly and took part in their conversation. After he brought some drinks, everyone started to feel a little drunk. Feeling like giddy teenagers again, they agreed it was a great idea when he suggested they play a fun game of truth or dare. They were soon left alone in her bedroom. After 30 minutes, they thought they saw Minnie in her living room, but when she went outside to check, Minnie appeared to have escaped. She grinned before returning to the bedroom. That evening at 9 o'clock, Minnie called her and asked if she wanted to go to the park with her because she was certain she was over that man. She didn't answer the phone or go to the door either. Minnie presumed she wasn't quite done with her guy and walked away from them. The following day, Minnie made another attempt to contact her without success. Minnie called the police the following day because she was concerned. When the police entered Lily's apartment, they discovered her lying lifeless on the ottoman. She had small, even puncture wounds all over her body's soft, pale skin, and her skull was broken. She had small slices in her skin, and human saliva was all around the cuts. The entire apartment had been thoroughly cleaned. Lily had her clothes neatly folded on a chair, and her bedspread was made. Because my husband and I are night owls, we habitually went to the gym pretty late and always capped it off with a quick soak in the hot tub when we first started dating. At midnight one night, we went to the hot tub where another ordinary looking guy was already sitting. He started chit-chatting with us and revealed that he was from Washington and was passing through town on his way to set up camp at some dunes in Utah a few hours south of where we were. Camping in these dunes might seem strange if you are unfamiliar with the state because they are completely remote and removed from any significantly populated areas. He also claims to be a house painter who only gets jobs from recommendations because he can work on the spot and avoid being found. Okay. This guy likes to talk a lot. We are mostly just sitting there listening because we can hardly speak. He somehow shifts the topic of the conversation to 9 to 11, the government's control over us, etc. We currently just politely act interested in each other, but I am beginning to sense something strange about him. The man begins relating drug-related tales about how he has always loved to party and how his neighbors have come to hate him. He detested them because they reported him to the police for abandoning a car on their property and refusing to move it. Since this happened four years ago, I wish I could recall everything. He claims that his neighbors are the reason he is out here. He was implicated in a murder case that he swears he has nothing to do with, according to a tip from the police. Additionally, he has experienced similar circumstances before. 
He had to leave because he was receiving too much media attention and had been camping the entire time to evade capture. However, CIA drones have been tracking him in the desert, making him suspicious. He simply knows it. We have become quite frightened at this point. I've been sitting here listening to him for almost an hour. It is extremely awkward when the conversation pauses. The guy suddenly realizes he has spoken to us too much, and the next thing we know, he is exiting the hot tub and walking away. It is late, and we are very uneasy. The room has a security camera, and I can still remember thinking this guy is being recorded. I'm the only person in the women's restroom as we quickly exit. You know I was getting dressed faster than ever, even though my heart was beating so quickly. We both agree after we depart and begin the drive home that this man unquestionably participated in the murder he was referring to. We double check that every door is closed, and I'm terrified that he may have followed us. My husband had his gun ready to load just in case, even though he rarely gets worked up over things like this and is usually calm. We began looking up information online because neither of us could sleep because we feared this creep was outside our apartment. We discovered the murder they were referring to, learned that there were suspects in the case, and discovered that the primary suspect was connected to a second pair of murders in Washington's forested areas. Although they were certain they knew who did it, they could not arrest because they lacked conclusive evidence. However, in that case, the guy was detained for a while after neighbors reported seeing an abandoned car. The suspect in the murder is the man from the hot tub who killed the girls. We couldn't fall asleep until morning, and the following day we looked for a place to leave information that might help the police solve the case. The day after my husband sent them an email with a few details about speaking with the man in the hot tub, an FBI agent called him to get the whole story. In closing, he thanked him and said how helpful he had been, 